Well, hello there. How is everyone? I hope you're all well on this fabulous, fabulous Thursday. I nearly, nearly said Friday. That's how much of an idiot I am. But no, look, it's still Thursday. You're still amazing. And this is video two of two. So if you didn't catch the first one, what are you doing? Well, at the moment, you're watching this one. After it, go and watch that one. Spot on. Let's crack on. So yeah, at the end of the day, we have a situation where we've got people who come to the platform, they're pushing stuff out like it's new. Pushing stuff out. They're talking about DNA and the fact that the DNA is being challenged by the defense in Brian Koberger's trial or upcoming trial. The sort of the, the, the warm up, if you like. Now that ain't new. <laughs> That's not new. For those of you who think that might be new, that ain't new. You know, at the end of the day, they've always challenged the DNA. And this is what I think, I genuinely think, and I want you to tell me after this video what your thoughts are on this, because I think that this could actually be the defense's potentially best and only way that they could get out of this trial. And what I mean is, I suppose there's two ways, and that is that they can prove that he shouldn't have been arrested in the first place, and the whole lot was farcical, so they get it tossed out, or it goes to trial, and by, we'll come to it. But no, look, the DNA has been an issue. Now, what we have to first of all consider, and yes, Brian Koberger could be guilty, and that's a very, very concerning thing. The fact that he could be guilty and he could now walk, because make no bones about it, he could get off this. And it's law enforcement's fault. It's law enforcement and the way the prosecution has behaved that is going to potentially feed into what Ann Taylor is very likely going to do. And this is what I mean. So, yeah, we have a situation where there is a knife sheath, apparently, with Brian Koberger's DNA on it. Now, rather than go through this convoluted sort of way of saying, look, someone could have touched someone, someone could have touched someone else, they could have touched the nose sheath and put the nose sheath there, and that's how you can get touch DNA, which is a fact, that is a fact, that you can get touch DNA by someone touching someone, touching something, and then that something landing somewhere else. It could happen. But why bother? Why bother doing that? Now, what we have to assume at this stage is that what they're going to go with is, look, my client weren't there. Simple as that. My client was not there. He did, do, he did not do this crime. And remember, she at this stage knows more than what we know. All of the things that are gagged, all the things that are hidden, and what they're continuing to hide further, and I will tell you this, they are Moscow, Idaho. They are upping the stakes with regards to blocking access to the documentation. Like, up to today, even me as someone in the UK could go onto their site and search their documentation. I would go through the, tour, the court PDFs. That changed today. So now I can't access them unless I go for a VPN service, and then I can. So they are trying to keep things very, very tightly hidden. And so what you've got to appreciate is the defense's job is now, I believe in this situation, in this case, is to say he weren't there. So in that event, we want to know as the defense how a knife sheath got there with his DNA on it. Because you can't prove it's him in the car. You can't really 100% prove that the car in the image is a white Hyundai Elantra. You can't. You can't do it. And that's why they're going after training records. Tell me, and I could see the defence bringing out a load of blurry pictures and saying, right, see, you as professional as what you are, what car is in this photo? And if they have prior knowledge, if they set up a situation where they know what the car is and see if this guy can tell the age, make, model of the car in the picture. Because that's what I would be doing. I would be setting up, as a defence team, scenarios, stage scenarios with cars that I know what they are and getting this so-called professional to tell me the car that's in that image. And look, that's only because I'm a smart ass. But Brian Koberg's DNA, so they're going to go for the fact that that ain't his DNA. You can't prove it's his car. There's no connection whatsoever. There's no DNA in his car. Nothing whatsoever. 
So how does his DNA get there? Now, if they can try and then utilize the other stuff that we've seen, and that is that these coppers, sadly, some of them are as bent as a two bob bit, and you can't escape it. You can't escape it. They have been involved in stuff like forcing people into admitting to murders that they didn't commit. Hiding evidence, it happens. Police, when put under duress, and if there's money involved and a higher power, they will do what it takes to get a conviction. Or they will close a case, like, and I've mentioned this multiple times in the Sean Doherty case, for instance, where they make a conclusion that makes no fucking sense whatsoever. No sense whatsoever. And even if you want to go with their narrative, the fact that certain things in that case points to another issue, they still ignore that as well, because the easier option is the one that they pick, and it's the cheapest. But with Brian Koberger, the defence are going to go balls deep in, it ain't him, prove it's him. And with all this convoluted shit and their reluctance to bring stuff and come forward with it and the delays and the delays and the delays and finding stuff, what else have they got? What else have they got? Tell me. All of you lot going on about phone pings. The information ain't back, and I've said it multiple times. They're waiting for the information. They're still waiting for the information. Now, some people turn around and said his phone was switched off. How do we know the phone just didn't die? I would be more concerned if during the time that this happened, bearing in mind what time it was, the early hours of the morning, if nobody's phone died, or if nobody switched their phone off, you couldn't convict and kill somebody because their phone just happened to be off during the time of murders and come back on and ping on the system. You, ca you can't do it. That ain't enough. It ain't enough. You would have to have a lot more stuff. And sadly, the stuff that's being pushed by mainstream media, which the vast majority ain't true, they can't use that shit. So most of the stuff that many people on this platform are using to convict pre-trial is fictitious. So that's not even going to be part of it. So you've got to think, what do they actually have? And at the moment, they have a knife sheath with his DNA on it that I believe strongly that there could be enough reasonable doubt if Ann Taylor, because Ann Taylor's smart as fuck, she could make it look like they were pressurised into a result. They had certain elements, had certain elements, the eyewitness, the car, and they could fill in some blanks and this guy just happened to be the guy who fitted the bill. So what can we do to make that work? I shiffle these bits about a bit and we should be able to make them work. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. I think he can walk. I genuinely think he can walk. And that should scare people. That should scare people. The guy could be guilty. I've never said the guy is completely 100% innocent because we just don't know. But there is a high, high possibility that he could walk. And he could walk because reasonable doubt exists. And enough of this stuff could be spun into reasonable doubt, unless there is indeed an ace in the hole in the background. But let me know down below, what would the ace in the hole have to be in order to guarantee a conviction and firing squad? I'll catch you all in the next one.